this is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. And the United Auto Workers Union is a very important union historically of working people in the United States uh, and also uh, a fight to protect the conditions. Um, that's an issue of uh, auto workers, particularly in uh, a COVID uh, climate where workers are uh, getting sick and, in, and dying on the job. And, uh, and also the UAW is facing a, a real crisis, institutional crisis, because the uh, union leadership, many, many of the union leaders are, have, are, uh, have faced uh, uh, hearings, judicial rulings, uh, corruption, uh, and um, it's happened throughout the union. And so now there is a struggle in the union around restructuring the union so the members have more control. And joining us is Scott Holderson, and he's uh, in a UAW Ford local in Chicago and has been active for many years uh, in fighting for democracy in the union. So welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity. So Scott, why don't you talk about your struggle uh, that you're taking up in the UAW, the issues that you face and, and why you feel there should be a structural change uh, in the way that the UAW operates? Well, currently what we have is a uh, convention system where we elect delegates to go to a constitutional convention and vote on our behalf uh, for who represents us at the international level of the union. Uh, but we've, we've seen through uh, uh, the decline in the UAW that that system has not been working. Uh, you know, we, we've faced concessions for uh, decades now. Uh, they've gotten much worse in the last couple of decades. Uh, but the uh, convention system has not uh, treated the, the auto workers well. Uh, and it's not just auto workers. We're a, a vast union of, of uh, many different sectors. Uh, but I'm an auto worker, so you know I understand the uh, the impact on auto workers uh, particularly. Um, so what's happened is that with uh, the convention system, uh, the same caucus has been in control of our union for 70 years, and they feel like they uh, uh, were, you know, above. Uh, obviously above the law, but also uh, untouchable by the membership. Uh, they've, they've become too disconnected with the membership and frankly, too close to the, uh, the company executives uh, who were supposed to be, uh, you know, they're supposed to be uh, having an adversarial relationship with uh, on behalf of the workers. But instead they've been uh, cooperating more with the company uh, to the detriment of the workers. Uh, so what we're trying to do is change to a direct election system uh, where every UAW member gets a, a vote directly for who represents them at the highest levels of our union, from the international president, international vice president, uh, international secretary treasurer, and regional directors. Uh, so there's been a corruption scandal that began uh, back around 2016, 2017, somewhere in there. And that corruption scandal has led to uh, at least a dozen top level UAW officials pleading guilty to taking bribes from the company, uh, to misappropriation of dues, and to shaking down vendors for, uh, to line their own pockets. And uh, you know, it's not in dispute that these things have been going on, uh, but still uh, our international leadership would like to keep the same system that put us in this, this position in place so that they can retain their power. And maybe you can talk about how the uh, administration caucus, that's the ruling caucus in the UAW, how do they operate so that uh, they keep control? I mean, both at conventions and as far as grievances, uh, how is its structure organized to keep them in power and threaten workers that challenge their, their power? Well, in the uh, manufacturing sector, um, you know, we're, we're a big manufacturing union and the, uh, the locals send delegates to the constitutional convention and those de delegates are often uh, leadership in their locals. So 
uh, in order to get favor in contract negotiations and also to be able to get uh, you know, grievances processed uh, in a timely manner and properly, uh, you know, they have pledged fealty to the administration caucus. Uh, also, another, another thing that the administration caucus does, they have a massive uh, uh, international staff uh, from you know, regional, regional servicing reps to uh, um, auditors to uh, health and safety reps. And many of them are paid through uh, joint programs with the company. And uh, so basically what, what happens is uh, uh, officers want to uh, get on international staff. So they have a, a path to possibly someday uh, getting to the top levels of our union. And, uh, you know, once you get on international staff, uh, you're, uh, you know, basically uh, obliged to follow whatever your boss wants. And uh, that has led to a, a, a culture of uh, corruption and cover up. And so the, uh, uh, the way they control the delegates is, you know, a carrot and stick approach. The carrot is the uh, international staff positions that, that are being offered. And the stick is the uh, potential for uh, uh, having uh, poorer outcomes for your local, uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, getting product in your local, in your uh, plant. How does that mean? Does that mean that they, uh, they won't fight the company to get product uh, development or in the plants or uh, they won't file or process grievances that members have? Uh, is that concretely what happens? Well, uh, the grievances, uh, I mean, sometimes they can, uh, you know, they, they prioritize what ones they want to take to arbitration and things like that. Uh, but the product in the plant is, is one of the keys. And uh, it was very uh, uh, telling at the last bargaining convention. Uh, product commitment was not on the, uh, the agenda. It was in the, in the, uh, uh, resolution, the omnibus resolution that we were debating, uh, but it wasn't on the agenda to be debated. And this was at a time when uh, GM had said they were planning to shut down uh, uh, Lordstown, uh, the Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant, and also the Detroit uh, 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 powertrain plant. Um, and, you know, they had, uh, you know, GM had announced this before the, uh, uh, the bargaining convention even began. So uh, during that convention, I noticed that that and, and a couple other topics like health care and pensions uh, weren't slated to be discussed. And, and when I got a point of order to try and get those on the agenda to be discussed, uh, Cindy Estrada ruled my motion out of order. And would not allow for uh, for us to discuss uh, product commitment, uh, health uh, healthcare, and pensions uh, when those were some of the key things that we were going to be negotiating in our uh, next upcoming contract negotiations in 2019. So it was, it was just mind boggling. So, so in other words, at the, the bargaining convention, they rule out of order. Bargaining in those critical issues? Uh, just discussion of those issues. You couldn't even discuss they didn't those want to talk about it. Uh, it, you know, it was in the uh, resolution that we ultimately passed. You know, dis, uh, you know, they had uh, the resolutions committee had submitted something about healthcare, about pensions, and about uh, uh, product commitment, but they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to debate it at the at the convention. And, uh, you know, so, like I said, they, they ruled, she ruled me out of order. I, I challenged the ruling, but, uh, you know, then she uh, required a super uh, majority to, uh, to uh, you know, overrule her and, and start the conversation on those topics or add those topics to the agenda. And that, that wasn't even a, an appropriate ruling uh, under Robert's Rules of Order. So. so you so you couldn't even have a discussion 
on critical points uh, that auto workers are facing at your own bargaining convention. Is that what? Yes, that's that's, that's how tightly it was controlled. So very top down corporate. Does, what does this have to do with business unionism? I mean, because I I've gone to UAW conventions. They have the companies there, and they have this partnership, which they say is uh, the way that to protect the workers and jobs. I mean. You think it's benefited this uh, business unionism, uh, the rank and file? Well, you know, business unionism, it, it can be defined in several different ways, but uh, I'd say the, uh, uh, the biggest issue is their cozy relationship with the companies. And this, this has gone on through joint programs since the 1980s. Uh, we've offered concessions. Our, our best contract came out in 1979. Well, uh, 10 years before I, I was ever an auto worker. And, uh, you know, every contract after that has either gained no ground uh, or lost ground. Uh, so to the point where now new auto workers uh, do not uh, have, uh, have a pension, they have a 401k plan, they do not have health care and retirement, uh, they get a contribution to their 401k. And then when they retire, they're on their own to go find health care on the market. Uh, and uh, retirees, current retirees have, have suffered as well. They, they have not received a uh, increase in, in pension benefits. Uh, and, uh, you know, current workers uh, that are legacy have not received a, an increase in pensions for uh, about two decades. And uh, the, uh, the issue of the auto industry, it's, uh, they took concessions during the uh, period when they collapsed the economy in 2008. Um, and they said that they would protect the workers, but uh, apparently these concessions continue. Uh, you have a two tier system in the auto industry. Uh, workers are coming in at, I mean, low wages, minimum wages. Uh, how does it feel as being a member of the UAW and fighting for democracy when you have workers working in the industry coming in and they're at minimum wages? Well, that's part of, uh, part of the reason that we're, that, uh, you know, changing to a democratic system is so important because the workers that are most affected by this, the uh, low uh, entry level workers, uh, you know, that first of all, uh, every worker that is hired in the uh, big three, uh, Detroit three, uh, nowadays comes on as a temporary worker. Uh, they work full time, uh, but they have a, a pretty much a probationary status for uh, up to two years. And then once they uh, convert over to seniority, then they have their uh, progression, an eight year progression to full pay, uh, but not to uh, full retirement benefits and, and health care and retirement. That's uh, completely out of reach of uh, the new workers, uh, barring uh, a renegotiated contract or a new negotiated contract that uh, reinstates some of those things that, that we've uh, given up in the, in the last couple of uh, decades. And what, one of the issues is uh, NAFTA and uh, USMCA, uh, these agreements. I, I remember uh, uh, the convention uh, in San Diego where uh, Clinton was speaking and he said to the auto workers at that convention that I'm gonna support NAFTA and you're gonna take it, whether you like it or not. And they gave him a big hand and they gave him money. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wasn't at that convention, so I can't, can't speak but to I mean, it. I, I was, I mean, it's pretty shocking. The guy says, I'm going to pass this legislation, which is going to encourage outsourcing of your jobs to Mexico and around the world. And then the union gives them a hand and supports them. Uh, in Mexico, a large number of workers' uh, jobs have been exported uh, to plants uh, where they have company unions. Uh, there was a strike, uh, Matamoros, of 70,000 parts plant workers. Uh, what did the UAW do to support these workers to fight for unity between uh, U.S. auto workers and Mexican auto workers who, so that they can not be pitted against each other? The, the UAW did absolutely nothing on, on uh, 
that strike, that particular strike that you're talking about, the uh, uh, the workers in uh, Montemoros and in, in Mexico, uh, the uh, and, or at the uh, uh, you know they just Soleo, uh, Soleo GM plant. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, the the they they uh, congratulated the workers after they threw out their uh, uh, company union. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, kind of ironic to see them uh, uh, congratulating them on getting rid of the company union uh, because the, the UAW has uh, turned into a company union themselves. And, and uh, you know, you, you saw that with uh, very clearly uh, with the uh, Volvo strike. Uh, you know, those, vo those Volvo workers, you got to hand it to them. They voted that contract down. Uh, by 90% while they were, uh, you know, knowing that they would be put, put back out on strike. And uh, then when they brought the same contract back to them while they were on strike, they voted it down by 90% again. And uh, then finally, after they uh, um, brought it back to them a fourth time, uh, it finally passed by, I think, about 15 votes. Uh, so... Uh, you know, that's showing that the UAW uh, leadership, the international union has not uh, been working on behalf of its members. They've been working on behalf of the corporations. Uh, the classic example of a company union at this time. Uh, we have the ability to change that and we have to do that. Uh, I think direct elections can be a big uh, motivator for changing uh, the attitude of whoever is elected to the international union, because the people on the plant floors are, are now going to be able to uh, reject them at the ballot box if uh, they don't deliver at the negotiating table. And direct election rank and file would mean that uh, instead of at the convention, the delegates voting on the president of the union, there would be the membership rank and file membership would have a vote on who they want. So you could have the possibility of slates of dissonance. And the early history of the UAW, there were all kinds of slates and opposition caucuses uh, that spoke out. Didn't that make that a stronger union actually when it, when it was formed? Yeah, there was, there was competition for ideas. And uh, you know, one of the ideas that, that died with uh, the end of factionalism uh, in the union was the shorter work week. Uh, and, you know, that's another con concession that, uh, you know, Walter Ruther, you know, as, as good as he was as president, he killed the, uh, the uh, move for a shorter work week. There was a, a push uh, among UAW members and leaders uh, to uh, reduce the work week to 30 hours a week with 40 hours pay and uh, therefore uh kind of being an offset for uh, uh, improvements in automation. And automation has just uh, been a, a huge job killer. Uh, I'm an electrician. Uh, I work on, on robots. And the robots that I work on have replaced uh, hundreds of workers, just the ones I work on. And there are uh, you know hundreds of electricians working on hundreds of robots. So, uh, you know, those, those things have uh, uh, had an, a huge impact, probably more of an impact on the employment level in manufacturing than outsourcing. Um, uh, as bad as NAFTA was, automation is, is the real job killer. And um, so, you know, that was a, a movement back in the, in the 1940s and 50s for the 30-hour week so that we could have more people employed. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of that was, was put into play with, uh, uh, you know, shortly after uh, Ruther's death, uh, Leonard Woodcock uh, negotiated a contract where you got monthly paid personal holidays. And that was an attempt to uh, uh, kind of do the same thing, hire more people by giving, uh, uh, manufacturing workers more time off. And the, uh, the issue of uh, solidarity with, with other uh, workers around the world, uh, 
I know that there's going to be a general strike in Korea on uh, October the 20th. The president of the Korean Confederation of Traders is in jail. Um, the UAW has said that they support that, but it seems like that kind of action in the United States is off the table, uh, mobilizing the entire working class. So it seems like uh, it's okay to talk to, to say this right on to the Koreans, but when it comes to uniting all American workers who face similar attacks, they, they don't want to talk about that. Is that really the, uh, the reality of the situation? Well, it is, and that, that's much bigger than uh, just the UAW, but the UAW would would not go along with that under our current structure anyway. Uh, but you know, it takes more than just a UAW to uh, have a general strike. Uh, so you know, that I would say is a a uh, a problem with the the labor movement in the United States in general. Uh, you know, we haven't had a, a push for a general strike uh, since uh, the early part of the 20th century. Uh, so. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, kudos to the, the Korean workers that are, that are planning to do that. Uh, and, you know, maybe we should observe that and, and uh, you know, try and take some lessons from it and, and see if, uh, you know, we can put pressure on uh, our own government to uh, make uh, lives of the working class uh, even better. And one of the issues that it was raised around the issue of Trump uh, the Vermont AFL-CIO, uh, David Van Dusen, uh, after discussion in their state federation, voted to support a general strike against an attempted coup and insurrection. Uh, and uh, Richard Trumka, the, head of the former head of the AFL-CIO, who passed away, said they shouldn't have been talking about that. That was off the table. So you have a threatened coup and insurrection in the United States and something labor shouldn't talk about. Uh, and he tried to put them in trusteeship, did an investigation. I mean, it seems like there is a growth of fascism. There's a growth of racist attacks. Uh, and the question is, what should labor and what working people do about this? This is a serious issue. Well, working people need to realize the power that they have uh, in, the, in their own hands, uh, you know, by, by putting down our tools. Um, so, you know, that, that, leads back to the the problem with uh, uh, labor in the United States is is that it has become too conservative and uh, you know isn't willing to stand up uh, for their members they're not willing to stand up to prevent a uh, a coup in our own government uh, you know it's, it's it's really tragic uh, but you know it's going to take a lot of work to turn that around and the UAW was one of the, an important union in fighting for equal justice uh, against racism. Uh, and also they supported the farm workers struggle. Um, it seems to have lost that, you know, as far as, you know, supporting struggles here and around the world in action, uh, which the UAW could play an important role in doing. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh... That's a problem with a, a business type union, unionism, uh, top down unionism, uh, is that when the members are not uh, intro, uh, when the members are not uh, intimately involved in the uh, the process of of their union, uh, then they don't feel like they they need to take action. They feel like the union is supposed to do things for them uh, rather than uh, help to guide them to do things for themselves to uh, protect uh, their way of life. And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, that lack of uh, involvement with the, the movements uh, that have erupted across the country uh, over the last uh, couple, few years uh, is kind of a, a uh, a symptom of business unionism, of top-down unionism. Uh, I think when you see the members taking control of the union, uh, you're going to see uh, more activity uh, with uh, with that, and that that's why another reason that uh, direct elections for international officers uh, can be a game changer. It, it you know it's going to take more work than just electing uh, officers. It, it's also going to take involvement. But 
you know, the uh, involvement of an election is is one step towards greater involvement. And why don't you talk about the specifics? When is this vote going to be? And it's not just going to be the auto workers. It'll be graduate students. There are a lot of other sectors that the UAW is involved in. Uh, I know in California, uh, UAW 2865, UC uh, is a big element, and they just got the doctoral students. So you're talking about you know, a lot of workers, not just manual workers, who are going to be involved in this vote. Right. Uh, the UAW has uh, a lot of sectors. Uh, we have a manufacturing sector that includes auto, includes uh, 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 agricultural implement workers, includes auto parts workers, uh, but also we have casino workers, we have state workers in Michigan, and I believe in uh, some in Ohio and, and Connecticut, uh, municipal workers. Uh, we have uh, um, graduate student workers at major universities from the University of California to Harvard to uh, Columbia. Uh, you know, there, there are just a, a lot of different uh, folks represented by the UAW. Uh, it's far from just manufacturing. And uh, the organization that uh, I helped form, uh, Unite All Workers for Democracy, uh, you can find out more information about us at uawd.org, and uh, you know I'd, I'd uh, you know recommend that uh, your listeners and viewers uh, go to uawd.org to find out more information. Uh, but yeah, we have this uh, once in a, a lifetime opportunity to get direct elections for our international officers uh, coming up very shortly. Uh, they have gotten an extension, so uh, the ballots will be going out on uh, October the 19th. Uh, there is going to be a mail ballot process, so the ballots will be mailed to every UAW member. And if you, uh, for some reason, didn't get a ballot, then you need to contact the uh, monitor uh, and let them know that you didn't get a ballot. There's going to be a process for that. Uh, we are going to, uh, you know, share that process with anybody that uh, signs up uh, to get information from UAWD. So, you know, while you're on UAWD.org, fill out the pledge and uh, pledge to support one member, one vote. And when there's uh, changes in the process, uh, we will update you about those changes. So the ballots go out October 19th. And they uh, have to be received by the election vendor uh, no later than uh, 10 a.m. on November 29th. Uh, so it's a month and 10 days to uh, get your ballot, fill it out, and send it back in for it to be counted. So I, I would recommend that you do that as quickly as possible because the mail can sometimes be delayed. And you, you want your ballot counted, get it in quickly. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Work Week. We've been talking with Scott Holderson. He's a Ford UAW member. Yeah, 551 in Chicago. In Chicago, and he's fighting for a more democratic union. So thank you for joining us on Work Week, Scott. Thanks for having me, Steve. I really appreciate the opportunity.